Hey, what's happening? My name is D, and welcome or welcome back to another episode of Book Reviews with the Regular Dude. Today, we're going to be talking about To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods by Melly. Nope. That's not her name, Molly X Chang. But before we get into that, I gotta give a quick shout out to my plus ultra don't fretter, my top tier supporter on Patreon, Laughing Cat Dog. Thank you for your support. You're helping to ensure that I'm able to keep creating this content and put it out as frequently as I do. If you also wanna help support the channel, make sure you consider subscribing to my Patreon. There you get an extra rant review video from me once per month, as well as access to my private Discord server, the Don't Fret Club Discord server. There you can chat with me and a bunch of really lovely people, talk about books, writing, anime, movies, cooking, pets, rocks, whatever. We're probably talking about it. We're also doing a book club where we like read a book and then I do a live stream. We talk about it. So if any of that sounds interesting or exciting to you, make sure you consider subscribing to my Patreon. And if Patreon is not really your thing and you just want to help out the channel, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. All right, To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods by Molly X. Chang. For those of you who don't know, uh, Molly X. Chang was one of the authors who was targeted, or I guess like review bombed by Kate Corain. Remember them? So this is a debut young adult fantasy, romance fantasy novel. And I believe it was originally marketed as like a Zutara romance. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But I think after the a couple of people like read it or after the book came out, it was sort of re revealed that it's actually a colonizer romance. Or I guess not revealed, but like after people read it, they're like, oh, it's not this, it's that. And after reading it myself, I don't. I, I don't fully agree, but I like agree. You know what I'm saying? Okay, let's read this premise. She has power over death. He has power over her. When two enemies strike a dangerous bargain, will they end a war or ignite one? Heroes die, cowards live. Daughter of a conquered world, Ru Ying hates the invaders who descended from the heavens long before she was born and defeated the magic of her people with technologies unlike anything her world had ever seen. Blessed by death, Born with the ability to pull life right out of mortal bodies, Ru Ying shouldn't have to fear these foreign invaders, but she does, especially because she wants to keep herself and her family safe. When Ru Ying's gift is discovered by an enemy prince, he offers her an impossible deal. If she becomes his private assassin and eliminates his political rivals whose deaths he swears would be for the good of both their worlds and would protect her people from further brutalization, her family will never starve or suffer harm again. But to accept this bargain, she must use the powers she's always feared, powers that will shave years off of her own existence. Can Ru Ying trust this prince, whose promises of a better world make her heart ache and whose smiles make her pulse beat faster? Are the evils of this agreement really in the service of a much greater good, or will she betray her entire nation by protecting those she loves most? Okay, so let's start with the spoiler-free section. As per usual, let's talk about characters, characterization. So as I mentioned before, it's my understanding that this book was originally marketed as a Zutara romance. No, Zutara isn't the name of a spaceship or some like fantasy world. It's a combined name of Prince Zuko and Katara from Avatar The Last Airbender. And like, I'm gonna be honest with you, if these characters are supposed to represent Prince Zuko, one of my favorite characters in all of fiction, and Katara, I don't, I don't think this author's like seen the show. However loosely this book is inspired by that fanfic ship, it's like too loose. Like it's such a stretch, you pull a muscle, you know what I'm saying? Antony, the, the prince of Rome, is nothing like Zuko, like at all. Like you could say that they both want a throne and are trying to prove themselves to a parental figure, but that's like not enough. Like even at Zuko's lowest, I just can't picture him inflicting the kind of cruelty that Antony gleefully inflicts upon Ru Yin. I'm gonna go off script a little bit, but also like, yes, Prince Zuko was raised with some supremacist ideologies being the Prince of a Fire Nation. And you can see him wrestle with those ideologies all throughout like season two and even into season three until he kind of, you know, until his arc is kind of completed. But at the same time, Prince Zuko at the core is a compassionate person. Like the whole reason he was ever banished in either adaptation of the show is that he didn't want, you know, young recruits who believed in his nation offered up as sacrifices for the front lines. And that's what got him kicked out because he showed weakness and disrespect because he was defying those supremacist ideologies that he was supposed to be indoctrinated with. Antony would absolutely 
sacrifice like young recruits for the front lines of a war if it meant gaining what he wants. And in season one, we do see Prince Zuko exhibit some chauvinistic tendencies in the episode where they go to Kyoshi Island. I don't remember if that's like three or four, doesn't really matter. But we don't see him trying to own people. That's not a thing that he wants to do. And I don't think that he would be okay with some of the cruelty inflicted upon the magic users in the book to gaze upon the wicked gods. Or is it just wicked god? I don't know. I keep adding a the whenever I talk about this book, so if that happens, my bad. Even when Zuko is a villain, he is the least villainous villain, and his main goal is to gain his honor back. He wants the approval, love, and acceptance of his father. Antony's only core motivation is the pursuit of power. He has a god complex, Zuko doesn't. Also, like, Antony is you know, white coated. I think the Fire Nation is based off of China. So like racially, they don't look alike. Antony doesn't have a scar. And I just like, I'll get into that in a second. But I just I don't see the resemblance between those two characters. And likewise, I don't like Katara as a character. But I have to put respect on her name. Katara is fierce, resourceful, powerful, loving, compassionate and selfless. Ru Ying is none of those things. Ru Ying is such an unlikable character that I, I find it impossible to root for her throughout the book. Granted, I understand that Molly X Chang is establishing an arc that's supposed to span over. I'm assuming a trilogy because that's usually how YA fantasies go nowadays. And I don't like where we stop in Ru Ying's arc at the end of the book. Granted, I don't really know like where you would stop or how to improve this. I, I also, I don't know if this needed to be done. Another thing that comes to mind, I'm going off script again, is that Katara would do anything to protect the people that she loves, but she's also way too self-righteous to sacrifice innocent people. That's like her whole shtick throughout the series is she's always kind of screwing over the, the, the crew in order to, you know, call out injustice. And she would never do the things that, uh, Ru Yin does in this book and she would probably lecture Ru Yin if she saw her do these things. I do not like the romance or the relationship between these two characters. It is a colonizer romance. Antony tortures, blackmails, and manipulates Ru Yin and I don't think that that kind of relationship needs to be romanticized. There is an inherent power dynamic at play here that just makes me feel grossed out. And I understand that that is probably the point. Ruin is the main character. We, um, we like she, it's a first person narration. So we're seeing the story play out through her perspective. And that's the perspective of somebody who's been brainwashed. I do believe that this is what Molly X Chang was going for. I just, again, don't think that this needed to be done. This book draws inspiration from the Opium Wars, I think the second Opium Wars, and the human experimentation done on the Manchurian people during World War II. And I think there is definitely a story to be told drawing inspiration from those historical events. I just don't think that this is the way to do it. I don't, again, I don't have a solution it's just that I, I don't think that this story needed to be romanticized. And this could have probably been fixed if it were done in third person. And maybe there's a character who's observing this. Like, Ruin has a sister who isn't really a major character or, like, is barely a character at all. And I think if we were watching the story play out from her perspective, I probably wouldn't feel the same way. But here we are. And also, I think marketing your books like based off of any fandom ship is a weird idea especially when your characters don't resemble the characters you're saying like inspired your story like personality wise or physical descriptions at least the Raylo inspired romance books the guy looks like adam driver you know what i'm saying and also zutara is a bad ship sorry I won't be engaging in any conversations about that. I get that this show means a lot to you and it came out at a time when you were starting to feel feelings and, and discover what romance is and you just want to see the best looking characters kiss but you don't have the guts to ship Zuko and Sokka because you're a coward masquerading as a revolutionary. But shipping Zuko and Katara is a gross misunderstanding of both of their characters, in my opinion.
And I also think that it undermines the beauty that is their platonic friendship and the amount of trust that Zuko puts into Katara before they've even fully reconciled. And I also think that it's really beautiful that Zuko ended up with the one person in the series he never had to prove himself to, Mei. And yes, there are side characters. None of them really have a lot of nuance or dynamics to their characterization. Um, like Antony kind of does because you need some humanizing moments. No, it's not that you needed them. It's that there had to be some in order for this like romance, this romantic tension being built uh, makes any kind of sense. He's just misunderstood and, and he's doing what he thinks is best for the greater good. And he's such a hero. Like there had to be moments like that in order for this to fly because if he stayed shitty or if Ruyin just kept thinking he was shitty, it wouldn't make any sense why there'd be any romantic tension. But at the end, I would say that all the characters in the story are pretty flat. Moving on to plot slash conflict. I got pretty bored in certain spots. Like there's some really cool stuff that happens, but there's a lot of like walking around and, and almost slice of life moments too and I just wasn't feeling it. I think that some parts of the plot were almost glossed over and rushed. That said, Molly X. Chang does something that I actually kind of like in the conflict and plot where there are consequences to Ruin's actions and she has to deal with them. And maybe that's more of a writing thing or maybe that's a characterization thing, but she does like have to like pause and self-reflect when something blows up in her face. Um... Now, now, now the author never puts, now Ruin and Antony are never put into actual danger, like the stakes don't feel high enough where you think Antony's going to die or Ruin's going to die or something like that or be injured in a way that has to carry out throughout the series or something. But um, yeah, like there are some, without getting into spoilers, there are some things that Ruin does that lead to damage being done and you know she has to live with that which i think is more than some young adult fantasies are willing to do world building um to be completely honest i didn't follow all of it like i don't fully understand like how the magic works there's like a little bit of maybe star wars or x-men type explanation for how some people have magic and some people don't i don't fully get how rome has the ability to like open portals to other earths but like the most advanced like technology or vehicle we hear about is like helicopters and stuff like that uh especially since like they managed to get cars into this world and i'm like okay but like you'd need some kind of really big aircraft to lower cars from a portal in the sky down to the ground right right I don't know. But again, credit is where credit's due. A couple days ago, I was on a live with my patrons. We were doing our book club meeting, and we were talking about, I don't even know how this came up, but we were talking about how in a lot of YA, it, they they write like how magic users are so powerful, but they're also somehow oppressed. And like that doesn't make sense. And I guess I haven't read enough YA fantasy for that to be like a common trope, but I knew what they were talking about. In this book, Molly X. Chain goes out of her way to explain to us why technology and guns and shit uh, outclass magic every time. And we're told that several times. So yeah, like, I, like yeah, I think the world building is fine. It makes enough sense. It's not rich, deep. This isn't a world I want to see or want to go to or like see animated or adapted to screen or anything like that. But it also wasn't like incoherent, inconsistent nonsense like some other fantasy books have read. And lastly, the writing, I... You know, like in a line by line sense, it's whatever. I think it's really repetitive. There's tons of internal conflict where Ruin goes back and forth and doubts herself. And it's really boring, you know, because it's just like, oh, I shouldn't be attracted to him because he's a bad guy. He does these bad things, but he's also a good guy. And he wants to save both our worlds and we could do it together. And I'm trying to protect my family. And it's like, we don't go like two pages without one of those sentiments expressed. And it is pretty annoying. Ruin has that argument with herself and two other characters several times. I think that the writing is a little too clunky and expositional for my taste. 
And I don't think that the themes were handled well. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the spoiler section of this review. So these are the notes that I took as I was reading it. Yeah, I, Spoiler for To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods by Molly X. Chain, I guess. So if my spoiler-free review made you want to read it, uh, leave now. Starting with chapter one, uh, two worlds. Rome is like science and... The other is magic. I think Ruin's talking about how like magic is a blade, but what is a blade to a bullet? And then my note was like, funny how me and the patrons were talking about magic users being oppressed by non-magic users in YA. The, the war where Rome came from their world to this world, conquered it, lasted a day. Ruin's grandfather was killed, all this stuff. Um, you know what? Okay, real quick. Uh, I totally forgot to mention this in the spoiler-free review. But something that just occurred to me that I think is important to note is that I really, really don't care for how addiction is characterized or like spoken about. And I understand that, the, again, this is from the perspective of a flawed individual who would probably see her parent who is addicted to opium in this light. But I think it's just so dehumanizing. And as somebody who has struggled with addiction in his life and has lost friends to addiction one kind of recently frankly uh, i don't really care for how there's like very little humanity or nuance to this depiction of people addicted to opium uh like there's just so little compassion and again i'm not saying like you know cut him some slack he's doing his best i'm not saying like cut the dad some slack because like he did some pretty shitty things and addictions can lead to people doing some pretty shitty things but i think it's like there's zero grace for the characters who are struggling with this. And that bothered me. Anyways, uh, chapter two, uh, Rian goes to an opium den to get the drug for her sister, who is an addict. The owner is a childhood friend who is a bastard with noble blood. And I don't mean he's like a bad dude. I mean, like he's an illegitimate child. And I was like, oh, dog, same. And then he offers Rian... Like, or he asks her for a favor where he, she kills someone for him in exchange for, like, protection for her grandmother and her sister. She says no. And, um, yeah, so she has this magic power where she can drain the life force out of people. And that's kind of it. Like, I think it gives her, like, a boost. Like, like she gets more energetic or something. But I thought it would be more interesting if she could do something with the magic like she can you know drain the life force and then i don't know shoot beams or move stuff with her mind or or give the life force to other people or something so i don't know they thought there was something there but nah uh Ruin sees a beggar on the street and a rich roman gives her a gold coin and then she like runs up and steals his pouch and she gets tackled by a Roman soldier and she nearly kills him with her secret death magic. The Roman sees her and then her childhood friend comes in and saves her. And the best friend is like a commander in their military. And she tells her about a rebelling that's picking up traction in the cities. And um, we used to tell each other everything. She's like, so like Rian's trying to ask her best friend whose name I don't remember like about what's going on and the best friend's kind of hesitant to tell her things and she's like well we used to tell each other everything and i'm like yeah but she's like a commander in the military she's probably not allowed to tell you like these could be like national security secrets or something like that and i just thought that was stupid and a lot of a lot of ya protagonists kind of have that very self-focused way of approaching relationships and kind of not seeing the bigger picture and i don't know if that's because they like the authors think that that's how young people see the world. Because the thing is that like I understand that some young people may not see it that way and they may not accept those explanations. But I teach like creative writing classes and poetry workshops in high schools. And I've had conversations with some remarkable young people. And these people absolutely would understand if you're just like, oh, I can't tell you that because I'm in the military and that's like a military secret. They'd be like, yeah that's fair they wouldn't be like but our friendship mm -hmm. and i just think that sometimes ya makes young people look kind of shitty and doesn't give them enough credit for their emotional maturity and how reasonable they can be 
that was chapters four and five and chapters six to eight uh, she comes home and her twin sister has raided her room looking for opium they argue and the sister calls her a coward for not using her death magic to help the rebellion and work for the leader who's called the phantom i'm sure that'll matter next book or something she talks to her grandmother and her grandmother says she's going up north to find a man for her to marry uh, the Romans come in the middle of the night and take her away and her sister and then my note was like the sister stuff feels shallow I don't know why well I, I can tell you past me um, the reason that it feels shallow is because it is it is shallow uh, there's not a lot of depth to this relationship it's just animosity and spoiler alert uh, the sister doesn't die but I feel like she might as well have you know like nothing bad happens to her really but she might as well have because I think that would have at like she's barely there and that just would have been another reason for or like another thing for Rian's uh, character development or something. Uh, chapters 9 to 11 she gets taken to a facility where people with magic are experimented on. Her best friend is taken and her old opium lord friend stops by and honestly like at this point I kind of figured I'm like okay so that Roman who saw her was the one who ordered this and they're going to experiment on her or something. And uh, I was right. Well, they don't experiment on her, but I was right. Um, so they make her demonstrate her powers for the princes of the Roman Empire, one of whom is the Roman from before. And then my note is, I swear if they have a romance, I'm sinking the ocean. Uh, so I'm going to have to sink the ocean. Don't know how I'm going to do that, but wish me luck. She almost kills a kid and then tries to escape. And the older prince, so not the pretty one, but a different one, tackles her and... Um, and then tries to inject her with opium so that she can be put under control. And the younger one's like, she's mine. I call dibs and I want her lucid. And I was like, already starting off to a great, great start with how this kid, this guy views women. I guess I kind of just don't fully understand how you can go from like, that person belongs to me to like, yeah, they're going to have a romance and that be that seem like a good idea. I don't know. That's not in 2024, you know? So in chapters 15 to 19, the second son makes a deal that Ruin will be his weapon in exchange for her sister and her grandmother's safety. He takes her to the opium den where her friend works or uh, run he runs it, I guess. And he tries to get her to kill a rebel and she hesitates, so then he's like, "Okay, cool." So they go driving to in front of her house. And he's like, hey, I'll kill you and your family if you don't get your shit together and start murdering people. And then he takes her to his house and he has like somebody locked up underground and then makes them fight in a cage. And he's like, either you kill this dude or you die. Your call. Chapter 20 is a flashback where we see the first time that Ruyin uses her magic. It's against the boy who, it's the first boy she ever kissed. And I think think he tried to drown her i don't remember uh my note taking was for shit because i was at work chapter 21 to 26 the prince gives a sob story about being adopted and having to earn his grandfather's favor to ascend to the throne there's a montage as Ruin kills like 50 people for him and the sister sees her killing and is really disappointed in her and denounces her as her sister good move i really agree with this sister wish you were an actual character because that would have been interesting like even if this was like dual pov like there's a chapter that's like from Antony's pov and i hate that shit but if it was dual pov or if the next book was like the same story again but it's the sister i don't know just something because she's more interesting and the conflict between these two could have been interesting. Chapters 27 to 29, uh, Ruyin goes to the prince's house and his brother is there and he tries to inject her with opium again. Antony comes back and chases the older brother away and then they talk. Uh, Ruyin has an internal monologue, what are we sort of thing. So she's like, what? What's going on between us? What is this feeling? I think we're about to kiss. And I'm like, this is disgusting. Antony removes her magic blocking bracelet because uh, she had to wear these like bracelets that could electrocute her whenever he wanted if she like stepped out of line or whatever. And he removes it. And he's like, I trust you. And this is like dog training type shit where you, you, you know, you train them to like 
stay on a leash so much that you take the leash off, they don't leave. That's what that is. Chapters 30 to 31, she goes to town and she gets pickpocketed by a kid who works for the opium den owner. And he's actually a rebel. Whoa, what a shock, because it wasn't shocking at all. And Ruyan's like, oh, I don't care. And also, Antony is a good person. Like, he's one of the good ones. And I'm like, what is this? What is this? Chapters 32 to 35, Antony gives her a mission to kill the emperor of a neighboring country. And they argue over it a little bit. And then, you know, she's just like, whoa, he's so evil. I can't believe the lengths that he would go to. But also... She's still attracted to him. She's still checking out his, like, muscly forearms. I don't think she actually said the forearms, but that'd be funny if she did. And, like, his jaw and his eyes and all this dumb shit. And, like, this is so fucked up and toxic, it makes me truly sad. Uh, Chapters 36 to 37, uh, she goes to the Emperor to warn him. So they're, like, staying in this dude's palace, and she, like, sneaks out of her room, jumps across the courtyard or whatever, and then goes to warn him, and he's like, yeah, I know obviously. And so basically, like, the idea is Antony wants to kill this emperor right after he signs a treaty, which forces his son, who would take over, to have to honor the signing of the treaty because he can't go against the last emperor's previous command. And the emperor is, like, okay with that because he doesn't want to go to war with Rome because he's seen what's happened to Ruin's people. So on the day of the treaty signing... Uh, Ruin starts to freak out, and then they argue a little bit, and then the rebels attack. In chapters 38 to 43, uh, the ghosts, as they're called, because they're led by the Phantom, that's so stupid, Ruin is injured, Antony tries to save her, and the ghosts want to kill Antony to start a war, because like, if he gets killed not on occupied land... That would give Rome cause to like start a war. The neighboring emperor sacrifices himself to protect Antony. And in a fit of rage, his son, the, the emperor's son, uses a bunch of water magic in Antony. And Ruin gets swept down a river. Ruin wakes up and they're in a rotten cottage in who knows where. And they share a bed and they almost kiss. I'm thrown up in my mouth. Antony is manipulating her. And in this mini chapter of his point of view... He reveals that he has plans for her world and she would never forgive him if she finds out. I hate mini dual POV, like where it's just like a one-off chapter where someone else's uh, perspective. They uh, like an example that makes no fucking sense to me is in Gothicana by Runix. Uh, there's just like one random chapter. It's like a paragraph that's like from the po- the point of view of I guess ghosts. Uh, And I just thought that was stupid. Like, it just didn't need to be there. It didn't create any intrigue, only confusion. Uh, In chapters 43 to 45, they are attacked again. Rian pretends to surrender the prince, and then they try to run. And they do the, like, I can't leave you. Well, I can't leave you nonsense. And then the prince kills the troop leader and stabs himself in the chest and then the soldiers find them, like the Roman soldiers find them. And then from 46 until the end, uh, my first note is gray between the black and white has come up twice in this book, and it's kind of annoying. Like, I think when you have a poetic phrase like that, I think you can use it once, but you got to find some other way to say that, like later on. That's just a personal writing. So then the opium best friend uh, finds her and takes her to uh, where she sees Roman scientists experimenting on her best friend. Uh, like, So he takes her back to the facility where she was held hostage. Um, originally, when they struck the deal, uh, Ruin and Antony struck the deal, he forced her, or she. one of her conditions was that her best friend be let go and never be harmed again. And he was like, yeah, totally. But nah, they experimented on her. And in this experiment, this like final experiment where they're gonna kill her, they're draining her of all of her blood. She confronts Antony after he's woken up like in the hospital or whatever, and he reveals that there's like cells in her people's blood. And Romans can use that for energy, so it's like a clean energy source, which I think is 
so dehumanizing and fucked up, which again, I understand is the point, but I was just like, oh, there's no coming back from this. And it doesn't seem like there is. So she goes back to her opium den best friend is like, okay, like you've tried to recruit me to the rebels a couple of times. I'm in because this has to stop. And that's basically the end of the book. So it's like a colonizer romance all the way throughout the book. And then at the very last second, it isn't anymore. It is romanticizing the relationship between like the colonizer and the colonized but at the same time the text eventually condemns that and shows that like and i guess in the second book like my hope would be that ruin has to really reconcile with all the people she's killed in the name of empire and all the people she's betrayed in the name of empire like the rebels are trying to recruit her because of her magic and for how useful her position is where she is. That all makes sense to me, but I hope they don't redeem her and make her like a hero. Like, I think at the end of the series, I think she does need to live up to that, like, heroes die, cowards live, and I think she has to die in order for her redemption to be, like, fulfilled. That's my opinion, obviously. This whole video is my opinion, so I would totally understand if somebody like DNF this because the romanticization, the power dynamic of that relationship and how toxic and abusive it is. I think it's supposed to be gross, but I also don't know if this story needed to be told. And that's kind of where I, I left off. You know, I was like, there's so much about this. It's kind of cool. And it seemed okay. So like a couple minutes after I finished this book, I, was, I hit up my patrons in the discord. I was like, Yo, this isn't exactly a colonizer romance, but it kind of is like, it's like a yeah, but wait kind of thing. And I thought it was like pretty okay. And like, cause at the end of the day, I think what would have truly made me think like this is absolutely a colonizer romance is if somehow like love conquered all. Ruin learns that love doesn't conquer all. Love will not conquer the conqueror. And I think that that's, kind of interesting so i'm intrigued about the second book and i'm 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 intrigued i like i, I want to know what happens next but i i originally i think i gave this book a three star rating maybe three and a half because i i am really bad with numbers but i think looking back on it now i think i would give it like 2.5 2.75 or something like that because there's so much that makes me feel kind of gross. And because there's like really cool stuff in this book for sure. And it's better than some other books that I've read for the channel. Absolutely. There's potential for a better book. And I think this story would have been told better if we weren't. If it wasn't first person narration and we had a different character who could kind of foil Ruin. Also, like the Opian Den best friend is supposed to be another love interest so there's supposed to be like a triangle he's barely in this book he doesn't count like there is no love triangle right now again i think that this has been set up for a series and i don't always love books that aren't stories within themselves like i think i would love to see more young adult or new adult fantasy standalones and like they could still be a series but it's like, and now here's a new quest or something like that. I don't know. That's just my personal thing. I've said it a lot, but that's just how I feel. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Special shout out to my super duper don't fretters, Keisha, Cassie, Nightsmith, and Oliver. Again, if you also want to help support the channel, consider subscribing to my Patreon. Also, I just made a new Ko-Fi page. I, I know that I had one before, but some stuff happened. I had to take it down and put up a new one. And so if you just want to send a tip like once to support the channel, that's great. That's a great way to do it. I have a goal set. Um, would love to make some more videos and different kind of videos. So I need like some new gear in order to do that. So I've set a goal and, and yeah, so that's there. You can check it out. I think I might do some like Ko-Fi exclusive videos once a month, maybe, I don't know. However you choose to support me, whether that's just by liking and commenting and sharing the video or supporting me on Ko-Fi or Patreon or whatever. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching this video. Again, my name is D. Don't fret. I'll see you next time. Peace out.